afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Recruit Military Live, a continuing series of live broadcasts covering all things military transition, veteran employment, mill spouse employment, and much more. My name is Lucas Conley, retired U.S. Army officer and former TAP program manager, here to share with you the ins and outs of navigating the waters of civilian employment. If you are in search of meaningful employment, not just a job, but your next career, then you're in the right place. Please take the time to visit rmvets.com slash live to learn more. All right, let's roll right in. Our guest today is uh, coming to us as the second part of a three-part series. Our focus, advanced resume writing. Uh, we want to take some time to help you elevate your resume from good to great. Not just the basics, but the keys, the tips, the techniques uh, that are going to take your resume uh, from okay uh, into the interview room. Our guest today is a man of many, many talents. Uh, in addition to being a professional resume writer and an interview coach, a uh, professional networking consultant as well, he has appeared in film on both big and small screen projects. 48 times he's appeared on the silver screen. And while this show probably will not appear at his IMDb page, I'm happy to say this will be his 49th appearance. Uh, his company, MJW Careers, has been helping clients draft world-class resumes to create attention-grabbing social media profiles, and to prepare for winning interviews for more than 13 years. His LinkedIn feed is littered with thank you notes and testimonials from successful clients. He joins, uh, he joined, as I said before, he joined us last week to talk about the critical importance of networking, to grow your professional network, and the better the odds of landing an interview. He's a man of many, many talents and a genuine subject matter expert. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Matt Warzel. I uh, appreciate everyone's time today, and uh, uh, you know, hopefully, something here will resonate and, and get get you folks into some nice roles out there. So uh, I'm all I'm all for sharing some of the goods that we that we uh, kind of understand and learn as we are uh, as career coaches and resume writers that we are. So hopefully, something will something will stick. <laughs> oh, I'm absolutely certain something will, Matt. All right, folks out there in LinkedIn and Facebook and Internet Land. Now that you know who we are, we'd like to hear who you are. Where are you watching us from? Uh, what's your status? What's your branch of service? Are you a veteran? Are you a mill spouse? Are you a transitioning service member? Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, Space Force. Uh, we want to hear who you are. Jump in that chat menu, uh, in that chat window. Let us know what your questions are, your concerns. Uh, we'll see if we can't get after it. All right, Matt. Uh, as they say down on the flight line, we are, we are wheels up. Matt, let's crack this open from top to bottom here. Let's talk resume formats. Uh, there are probably about five or six generally accepted formats. We've heard about chronologicals, functionals, combinations, CVs, and, the, and so forth. Uh, I think the first step that most people stumble with is, which one of these formats is right for me? Your thoughts. Absolutely. Formatting is, is just as important as the content, I will say that. And first and foremost, if you are someone who wants to go into the federal space, as a lot of my uh, military to civilian or military to federal clients um, you know, kind of prefer they want to get into get into that GS world. There is a separate format, and if you need it, email me or message me, whatever. At the end, I'll let you know where where you can find me. But I'd be glad to share the template. Um, but if you are going for federal roles, USA Jobs does prefer a singular format. So outside of that, let's talk private sector. Um, my preference is combinational, and here's why. Uh, combinational is clean in terms of here's your linear work history. So it still covers that chronological kind of theme, which let's be honest, recruiters don't want to have to spend time figuring out where you worked and when. I love getting resumes that they have zero dates on them. I'm like, okay, um, this is, you know, th th that is something new. Uh, but recruiters, they want make it easy for them. They're busy bodies, right? So combinational is neat because it starts with the accomplishments before the actual chronological history, the work history. And that little accomplishment section is so key to kind of deliver your top, I always say five-ish, wow statements. And by wow statements, you're talking, what, what is the best things you do as either A, relates to the role, right? Which What's your transferability, we'll call it. Um, think in terms of like reverse engineering off the job description. If yes. they have you know, five, six things on there that are the main things you're gonna be doing, get those on your resume, but spin them in your own way. Don't just copy and paste them, right? You want to make sure you're kind of what's your onus for each of those tasks. Give them an example. If you had to do full cycle project management, talk about a really neat project you handled full cycle. What was the budget? 
maybe the headcount and what was the success, right? So make it your own. Um, and if it doesn't have to do with relatability, then at least think operationally. What was the bottom line impact? What's your key value in terms of how you're going to make the workflow flow? So if you got reducing waste, streamlining efficiency, you know, uh, 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 driving revenue, cutting costs, these are things that are operational. These are things how your managers like to see because you're thinking about the bottom line and, and it makes for a better read. Uh, or I would say the third thing you can think of is anything that's unique. Some awards. Uh, did you get featured in a newsletter or a newspaper? Uh, or did you give a speech at a big conference, an industry conference, what have you? So if you stick to those three ideas, it'll mold your sentence structure even better within that accomplishment section as well as your experience section. And that's all combinational formatting is. Instead of going summary skills right into the experience, combination allows me to add that accomplishment section. Right. And, it, and I think one of the great things about the combination format, especially when you're grouping similar accomplishments, whether it be project management or organizational development or uh, leadership or what have you, or supply chain management, you can take those things that are key functions in different businesses and then group those accomplishments. So if, for example, you're applying for a job as uh, environmental health and safety, uh, right? And uh, in your current job, you're doing some safety stuff. Say you're doing aviation safety. And five years ago, you did aviation safety at Fort Rucker. And four years before that, you did aviation safety uh, at Camp Pendleton. And four years, you, you don't force the hiring manager to go and read your entire career and pull out all those safety bullets right. and try to lump them together. You take that functional group of accomplishments and you give it to them up front. Boom. Here's my list of aviation safety accomplishments in a nutshell front page. Make sense? Exactly. Great way also for the folks that maybe I get some IT folks that are proud of their old big blue days, you know, they're 1995, what have you. And they go, well, it's still relevant. Some of these things I've been doing. It's like, well, let's just drop the dates, though, and drop big blue and then kind of flesh in some of those accomplishments at the top. Then at the interview, you can tell them, oh, that was back when I was working for IBM in you know, 2000. So the little little tricks like that that'll help make for a better read, but also stay relevant. Makes sense. Makes sense. Now, one of the things that I talk to folks about in my current and my previous roles is the amount of time that that hiring manager, that that HR manager is going to spend looking at your resume before they decide... Yes, I'm going to keep it or no, it's going in the trash. And for, uh, depending on the source, I've heard seven seconds. I've heard 10 seconds. I've heard 15 seconds. What can you do to help your chances of getting that HR manager to spend more than 10 or 15 seconds on your resume? A, you have to have the formatting because when they look at it, they want to ensure that it's playing the game, if you will. And when I was a recruiter, if I saw something that was sloppy or half written, you can tell right away, right? So take some pride in your sentence structure. Take some pride in your grammatical, uh, you know, monitoring your grammatical. Uh, and you can use Calendly. There's a plenty of free resources, word, word spelling, what have you. Um, and then if you have the right formatting and you have, you kind of had that kind of way of that, like you're kind of playing the game, if you will. And playing the game by that, I mean, you have a, a summary up top, you have some skills, you have those accomplishments, you got an experience, you have your education, certification, affiliation, volunteer. That's the order. Keep it in that order. You're going to get past the 10 seconds, but then they're going to give you that, let's say two minutes to actually read through your kind of career path, right? Your trajectory. And they'll figure out if that's someone that is viable for the fit. So it all comes down to the look and the aesthetics at first. And then it comes down to the uh, what's the experience look like? Is this a person a job hopper? You know, what are some red flags? Because remember, everyone's very anti the resume at first. They don't, they're like, they want you to be the person, but they're also going to have this kind of negative connotation of like, let's make sure they're not the right person, but convince me otherwise, you know? And so you want to have that, that, that ability to kind of say, no, 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 I'm, I'm a good fit here. So here's why. Um, then the language plays in. Now it's, what are the sentences that you're writing about? What are those wins? They'll start diving deeper. And if they are impressed with your language, now they're going to want to call you and spend a half hour. So it's a kind of a hierarchy of how you get to the hiring manager, sourcer, recruiter, hiring manager to get through each of those layers. You got to make sure it looks good and the content's written well. But the initial five, six, seven, ten seconds, what have you, it all comes down to just make sure it doesn't look sloppy and you have the right sections in place. Now, I had actually somebody try this with me, and they handed me the resume, and they said, start reading, and when I say stop, you stop. Invariably, and I've done this exercise with a number of other folks, invariably, I don't make it past half the page. So one of the things I've recommended to some folks is take your resume, fold it in half, 
tear the bottom off and then ask yourself, will I get an interview with just what's on this top half? I love that. If the answer is no, you might need to reshuffle what you're putting in front of the HR director. Absolutely. And the summary is so important to kind of set the tone as to how you're going to make their life easier if they hired you. You're going to resolve their pains that are op- because of the opening and what's your key value and your unique selling proposition. What makes you different than the Lucas is behind you? All the ones that have the same credentials, but why are you a little different? So that summary is so important. And that's where people pay me to help because it, it takes a little talent to kind of, it's not just a skills dump. Please don't put you're a resourceful team player with skills in supply chain management, procurement, uh, purchasing, and blah, 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 blah. It's not supposed to be a skills dump. It's it's a unique sentence structure. And I'll tell you, if you do it right, you're, you're going to have a lot lot, lot better uh, interview requests coming. Yeah. Ultimately, the resume is the tool to get you the interview. And the employer wants to answer three questions. Can you do this job? Can you generate results? Will you fit in with my corporate culture? Uh, the rest of the stuff is background. It's uh you as a professional, as an individual, but you got to answer those three questions. Absolutely. So as we move into this digital era, I shouldn't even say move into this digital era. We're in the digital era. Look, at we're on the internet right now. How are we <laughs> not in the digital era? What am I talking about? Uh, some employers, particularly at career fairs and especially with COVID, they don't want your paper resume. You pull out the paper resume like they always say, hey, go to the career fair, have bring copies of your resumes. You go to hand it over to them and they're like, no, 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 uh, go on my website. No, 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 I don't. I don't take paper resumes. So I've heard of some folks that are coming up with some creative uh, workarounds with this, popping up the QR code for their LinkedIn profile on the phone, even adding a QR code up next to their administrative data, right next to their name on the resume, uh, having a QR code that links to a digital repository where their resume can be found and putting that on the back of a business card. Are these handy tools or are these just digital time wasters? What are your thoughts? This is a good question. So, from a macro level perspective of a hiring of a uh, resume writer that was a recruiter at first, um, I have a hard time having any graphics or or anything on the resume that is not language, right? So columns, text, text uh, uh, boxes, uh, pictures, QR codes. So I would say that if it's on the resume, just be be mindful of who your target audience is. Um, I'm totally fine with some maybe technical folks, uh, maybe some creatives. Um, but if you're a product manager who, um, you know, is, is, you know, trying to work at Boeing and stuff, yeah, it's technical, but you're not, the QR code is not going to be the reason you got in the door for the interview. So mm-hmm. think of it like this, will this help me or hurt me? And if it hurts me, why have it? So I do like the, uh, th- there's a couple things why I like the QR code though on your phone. Like you said, if you're in a situation where it's like a digital business card nowadays, rather than handing them a business card, you hand them, you, you, you swap the information on the phone. So I would say keep it handy because what's a half hour to set something like that up and then have that digital kind of URL code that you can kind of, you know, use everywhere. Um, but as far as on the resume, again, it's like why the, the hiring manager might not want to hunt for your details. They, they might just want to see your resume and then maybe pop over to your LinkedIn and call it a day. So be mindful of like, what are you really going to have as an advantage if you were to have a QR code on your resume, as far as your phone though, yeah, go for it. That's not a bad idea. It doesn't take long to set up and it's not going to hurt anything. Okay. All right. Great perspective. I love it. I love it. Now let's talk for a second about branding. Now, last week when we talked about networking, we talked about branding. And for those who didn't tune in last week, uh, one of the things that we talked about was uh, consistency in branding as far as your professional summary, your LinkedIn profile, uh, and your 60-second uh, sell or your 30 second elevator pitch, uh, whichever version you prefer. Can you talk for a second about the importance of branding when we draft that professional summary section right up there under your name, phone number, and address? Yeah. And that's kind of where I'll kind of piggyback off. I said earlier is this is, this is your chance to, to explain to them that here's the world you live in. Here's your space. So if I'm looking for a procurement person, I want to see supply chain relatable information in the summary. You want to set the tone as being someone that lives and breathes in that space. So you're branding yourself as a supply chain person. And now the more niche you go, meaning if you're someone who wants to do procurement, purchasing, buying, you don't want to handle maybe inventory or, or, or I mean, like, I guess that's a part of that, but you know, maybe there, there, there's certain parts of the supply chain you don't want to be involved in, then get more niche because the more, focused and dialed in you are on just not just a summary but your overall message on your of your resume your overall brand um 
the more niche, the better you're going to have a success at finding the role you want to do, not just the one that's necessary evil. So think in terms of fleshing some nice soft skills, not too many, but this is your one chance to, to flesh in some soft skills within the summary on the resume. Um, have it have a noun that is very active in, in a sense of what you what you're doing. So don't just say, like we said, resourceful team player. Cool, but everybody's a team player. It should be resourceful purchasing agent, resourceful procurement specialist, resourceful, mm -hmm. whatever. Get the point across. And then that's where you hit them with the key value. Hey, I can handle full cycle. I can handle cost savings. I've handled vendor management and be able to find uh, uh, continuous improvements and ways to like streamline deliverables or ensure that the uh, forecast and stock and everything's aligned properly. Whatever. You don't have to go too deep dive, but the quicker you can get to that point of like what's your big value and what's your brand within that, we'll just say supply chain world, then they're not going to have any uh, inconsistencies. They're, they're not going to need any clarity. They're going to go, hey, I know Lucas is a procurement person. We have a procurement opening. Let's talk to the guy. You know, so that's all you're trying to do. Get him on the horn, right? Get him in the next the next phase. Um, so keep that in mind. The more intentional and the more niche, you're, gonna, you're just going to look for a better read. And it's going to it's going to do much more for you to advance you to the next phase of where you're trying to be. Right, and absolutely, and I, and I would expand on that by by reminding folks the old adage, you know, dress for the job you want, not the job you have. So if you're branding yourself as a uh, supply chain manager, you're branding yourself as a program manager or whatever it is, whatever that job is that you want to have, brand yourself for that role. Don't put transitioning service member with 20 years of experience managing teams. We're not hiring for a transitioning service member. We're not hiring for uh, a, a, a retired colonel, sergeant major, whatever your rank was. We're hiring for a program manager we're, pro, we're hiring for a procurement manager. We're hiring from a logistics specialist. So speak to me in terms of what it is you can do for my company, not what it is you used to do. And please dump the photo in the uniform. Show me what you're going to be for my company, not what you are now or have been in the last 20 years. Does that make sense? It does. I love that. And, and and that's no offense to anybody out there in the military. And that's not Luke. You know, we're we're not saying, hey, we're not proud of what you did and your achievements. But he's right. I mean, there's a lot of and there is bias in some of the workforce, you know, in terms of ageism, military, sexism, all the isms. So give yourself a fair shake and just know that the civilian world is your new world. So start, like you said, act the part. And, and but know that, hey, on the resume, you can still have a little section with your military, you, you know, it, where you, you can explain to them that you are an ex because that does resonate in some circles, too, where they're going to want to only hire ex-military because maybe mm -hmm. the hiring manager, you know, has, has a passion for that. So um, and I've never seen it really. You know, I mean, personally, I've never really seen it hurt. It's but if you overdo the military, it just doesn't give them a chance to understand that you can be civilianized and kind of act in this role. So give, and also <laughs> drop acronyms. I mean, please, no one yes. cares about your acronyms anymore. Um, and if it's an HVAC person, make it HVAC. Don't make, I think it was what machinist made or uh, whatever the HVAC person was in the military, switch your title. So it is privatized. It's really nice. Yep. Yeah. So keep those things in mind, less military esque. I say, goes for my IT people too. My IT people love dumping a bunch of acronyms on their resume. And I say, no, 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 no. You got to cater to the marketing sourcer who has no idea what IT stuff is. They're just there to source and know what they have to kind of look for. Um, so make it easier for the audience to understand your intent. All right. Hey, well, we got a question here from, uh, from Anthony and he actually hits on the point and I was just about to make. Um, <clears throat> a lot of folks out there want to put on graphs and blocks and columns and charts and, and all kinds of fancy stuff. Uh, but the question is for me, is this going to get through the ATS? The last statistic I heard was 98% of the companies who are hiring today, 2022, are using an applicant tracking system to screen resumes long before they get into human hands. What should job seekers know about these systems and uh, what can they be doing to increase their chances of beating the box? Great question, Brandon. And, and essentially, here's what you want to do. Less is more, right? So as I mentioned earlier, no text boxes, graphics, all that kind of borders. Take it off. The, the meat and potatoes is the content. Content is still king. What, what can you do for me uh, is the mentality that they're having. You know, what, what kind of person are you in terms of, a, of, of, of a, val, a viable candidate? So don't worry about the bells and whistles. Having said that, if you're in someone who's in advertising or a graphic design, visual artist, that kind of stuff, have two resumes. One is professional. You apply through the applicant tracking system with that and use the other as an addendum. We call them infographics. Um, I like that. as an addendum, right? So at least they can see your creative flair as the as 
uh, an extra document with the cover letter, but their professional document at least gets through so it's it's parsed correctly so the robots aren't getting hung up. Now, having said that, applicant tracking systems, yes, they are more sophisticated. Back when I was a recruiter in the 2000s, all these things did was dump your information into a system, and I had a candidate in front of me. I, there was no gatekeeping. There was no questions and stuff up front to see if they get through. Um, so it is a little bit harder for the candidate to get through in some of these rules. Not all of them. Some companies don't have those rules set up. But that's the thing is, why guess? Don't take a chance. Simplistic, minimalist approach to your formatting. Still looks good, though, right? You still want some of those little visually, the aesthetics are still intact. But less is more and, and worry about the content and what you can do for them, not, not the way you're laying it out. You know, I like that. And I don't think I've ever heard anybody say it that way because there, there was, I was reading one uh, reference and they talked about having an ASCII plain text version of your mm -hmm. resume for upload. And I'm not sure how relevant that is these days, but I like what you're saying about, hey, have a keep it simple, um, keep it simple version that you give to the computer. And if you know that it's something is going into somebody's human hands and you've got a little, it has a little flair, a little panache, some extra colors, graphs, columns, whatever works, uh, hand that to the human being. That makes more sense than I think I've heard anybody kind of couch that. And yeah. surprisingly enough, I've never heard that before. That's, that's very smart. They appreciate that. That addendum, that that click attachments area of the application, you should be adding your cover letter, by the way, even if you don't have anything else to add, always add the cover letter to those addendum parts. But that's like a wonderful area to just kind of, you know, give them some more goods, right? And who knows if they open them or they don't, but it doesn't hurt. I mean, I don't know, Matt. I heard people say that the cover letter is as dead as the brontosaurus. It's ancient. I never read them. <laughs> I, I heard it's ancient history, and you're telling me add a cover letter. Add a cover. Oh, you have to, because the ones that want to read them, they mandate them. I had hire managers that are wonky that go, I want to see how they present themselves to me before I even look at their career snapshot. I've had hire managers don't even look at resumes. They only look at cover letters, believe it or not, when I worked at Goodrich. Um, so have it. It's a necessary evil. And it, you don't need to be this one that customizes each and every part of it. Keep it very, you know, kind of boil plate, boiler plated. But um, know that in some circles, cover letters are still favored. And in, in even more so, Having what we call like a disruptive cover letter, a brand, a brand advocate cover letter. There's multiple cover letters now. Some of these get really neat, and I actually kind of like writing them because they are different than just the "here's my qualifications, I'm a good fit" kind of thing. So, but um, for anybody out there who doesn't have it, just punch it up, keep it simple, write in why you're good at that kind of role, and just remove the date so you don't have to keep dealing with stuff. Dear hiring manager, leave it as is and just copy, uh, attach it every time. Yeah, well, folks, you heard it here. We settled the controversy on cover letter or no cover letter. The answer is yes, right one. <laughs> However, I would also point this out. Look, it has to be good. Yeah. Because I remember when I was a hiring manager, I got a resume that was just fantastic. It, it, it kind of made me believe that this individual had used the resume service, right? Right. But then I read the cover letter and I realized that the person who wrote the resume was not the same person that wrote the cover letter. <laughs> You'll have that. It could backfire. <laughs> because the resume was world class. It was good. And the, the, the cover letter was written at about the fourth grade level. Um, yeah. That, yeah. That, I, that, I didn't hire that person. You need, yeah. And that's the other thing, too. You need, that's why I don't do resume edits. I only do full conversions because. You need the messaging and the tone and just the way the prose is written. Like you said, you could tell who, you know, one thing's written by someone and written by someone else. So you want to make sure all your language is consistent. So if you have someone helping you with the resume, have them do the cover letter. If you wrote the resume and it looks really good, like you had mentioned, you probably wouldn't have a hard time doing the cover letter. But again, I mean, I don't, you know, just depends. Everyone's different. But yeah. And also the cover letter, you can't add a little personality. Use personal pronouns, me, I, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Whereas a resume all professional. Yeah. And you mentioned, Hey, if you've got somebody helping you with your resume, let me just throw a piece of advice out there. If, if for some reason, first of all, if you're investing in your future, all right. And you are not a resume expert and you don't have a resume expert near you reach in your pocket, spend a few bucks, get someone who's a professional to do this. All right. Because uh, if you're relying on someone like your sister, your brother, your cousin, aunt, uncle, nieces, and nephews to give you, give you feedback, <clears throat> unfiltered feedback, uh, you may be going down the wrong road. All right. And, and if you don't believe that, then watch any of these talent programs when someone who can't sing steps on the stage and is absolutely embarrassed in front of a national audience because their mom or their auntie or their grandmama 
has been telling them for 15 years that they sing like an angel and all of America knows they can't sing the way out of wet paper bag. I love it. <laughs> good, that's a good comparison. I dig that. <laughs> you because know, I had somebody bring me a resume and said, oh, this is a great resume. My sister is in HR. She went over it. And I looked at the first page and everything looked good. And I looked at the second page and I said, what's your name again? He says, my name is Frank. I said, well, on the second page, your name is John. Oh, wow. you, you might want to reread this. So Holy moly, yeah. 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 And I can't even tell you how many times HR professionals, I love them. I'm, I was a part of them, but not all of them know what resumes are. It's, it's, it's a different beast than just being in HR and being around them once in a while. Um, recruiters, uh, you know, resume writers, career coaches, those people interact with resumes all day. But HR generalists, HR specialists, that kind of stuff. Yeah, they're in there, but they might not be reviewing resumes. So make sure you're taking uh, with a grain of salt whatever advice you're getting from people that aren't in this business as a resume writer. All right, Matt, as always, I get back to my favorite question. My The question I ask of all my victims, excuse me, all my guests, <laughs> you've got just 30 seconds, 30 seconds to give one piece of advice to a transitioning service member, a veteran, a mill spouse, someone who's out there in the market looking for the next career opportunity. 30 seconds, one piece of advice about resumes. What do you tell them? Think pragmatically. Think logically. The more you waver left, right, cute, fancy, funny, quirky, the more annoyed people are going to be. They 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 are busy bodied. The recruiters, I always throw a shout out to them. Um, they're busy bodies, and so you got to help them help you. Right, that idea. So keep it again. Keep it super simple. Uh, keep it neat, concise, and get to the point with your writing. You don't need these long paragraphs and all this kind of stuff. Just button it up and keep it logical. All right, fantastic, Matt. If folks want to connect with you further uh, and uh, solicit you for services, advice, uh, assistance. Where can they reach you? Jobstickers.com. You guys head over to jobstickers.com, like pot stickers. Uh, and uh, it's embedded into my websites, my blogs. So, and feel free to message me through there if you want a template of that uh, federal uh, template, the federal resume template. Absolutely. Once again, Matt, thanks for being on the show. We're going to enjoy the pleasure of your company one more time next week. All right. I'm looking forward to capping out the three part series. And folks out there in the audience, if you haven't already done so, do yourself a solid and use the link. It's going right across the screen there. All right, rmvets.com slash live. That'll take you to our website. We'll find over 450,000 job opportunities for more than 16,000 employers around the world and around the corner. You'll find information about our job fairs, monthly, nationwide, in-person and virtual, and a library of content all designed to help veterans, transitioning service members, and mill spouses find meaningful employment opportunities. On behalf of Recruit Military and the folks that have joined us today, Matt, thanks for being on the show. Thank you, guys. It was a pleasure, Lucas. And be sure to tune in next week, folks, as we explore the topic of advanced interview skills with Matt again. He's going to take us down the road and uh, give you the advice, the information, the tips, the techniques to take your good interview skills and take them up to great. All right. So don't miss it. On behalf of Recruit Military Live, this has been Lucas Conley. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, good luck and Godspeed. <laughs>